for our leaders than in uh, the pressures and burdens they bear and the responsibilities in these challenging times. For the perpetrators of violence and conflict, then and now, that the power of peace and the strength of sacrificial love will soften hearts and change minds and transform a belligerent cauldron of conflict into the beloved community that we are. For all of us, exhausted and uncertain, longing for an end to pandemic and polarization, that we might find an embrace of grace and the assurance of hope. Hear us, gracious God. In the name of the one who knows us fully and loves us freely. Amen. Amen. In our exhaustion, we are embraced. In our uncertainties, we are assured. In Jesus the Christ, we are accepted. We are forgiven. We are loved. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now, friends, the peace of Christ be with you all. I invite you to stand and from a safe distance, pass the peace of Christ to those near you. Peace be with us all. Sounds like we have contact. Brian went like this. <laughs> I won't move. You know, friends, in the challenging times that we're living in, our world, our lives have been turned upside down. And as I mentioned in weeks past, it's like we finished one marathon and they slapped another number on our jersey to run another one. And we've chosen to walk this one. And a part of that walking involves us taking time to stop, to rest, to reflect, and to recenter in the core of our beings, in the connection that we have with our gracious God, 
who is the core and center of our lives. To experience that presence of Christ that is encouraging and empowering. And so we've decided as a community to take this fall to focus on what is God like, to get back down to the essence of who God is and who we are. We're inspired to do this by a children's book, a children's book entitled What is God Like? It was written by a woman named Rachel Hill Evans, who was an incredibly gifted author who had been through a lot of twists and turns in her journey of life and faith and came to a place where she could use her gifts of writing and communication to speak of spiritual things and the presence of God in ways that could transcend traditions, not just within Christianity, but beyond Christianity, to people of all different kinds of faiths and even those who are uncertain of any faith at all. Rachel's life and world was turned upside down by unexpected illness an illness that ultimately led to her death at age 38. A wife, mother of two young children, gone in a matter of days. And yet in her final weeks with us, after writing four best-selling books to the general public, she started writing down notes for children's stories, for ways to take those heady, weighty concepts and incredibly powerful presence of the divine and be able to respond and share those realities with young children. She was never able to complete any of those notes that would have become books, but through a friend of hers and fellow writer, Matthew Paul Turner, they have finished the first of those books, which is called What is God Like? And Sarah is now going to share with us that story. What is God Like? By Rachel L. Evans and Matthew Palter. What is God like? That's a very big question. One that people from places all around the world have wondered about since the beginning of time. And well, nobody has ever seen all of God, because God is far too big for any of us to fully see, we can know what God is like. God is like an eagle, sharp-eyed and swift with wings so wide you can play under their shadows. God is like a river, constant and life-giving. When you grow near God, you'll sprout up strong as a tree. God is like an eagle, sharp-eyed and swift. Oops. God is like the stars, forever present and bright. Even when they feel far away, you can always look up and see them looking at you. God is like a shepherd, brave and good, a protector who loves her sheep so much that she watches over all of them and knows each of their names by heart. God is like a fort, strong and secure with walls that are mighty and Inside, there are hidden places to hold you when you're scared or need a quiet place to rest. God is like a gardener, patient and nurturing. God plants, waters, weeds, fertilizes the earth until every good thing on it seeks the nourishing sun and grows. God is like the flame of a candle warm and inviting. With God close by, you can look to the light and see through the darkest of nights. God is like the wind, 
passionate and full of mystery. God is both here and mysteriously also over there. God is everywhere, swirling through the world, whistling across mountain ranges, rustling through trees, and pressing against your cheeks on a breezy day. God is like an artist, creative and unpredictable, always busy making and remaking everything built and new. God is like a mother, strong and safe. You can crawl up into her lap whenever you want to, and she will hold you until you fall asleep. God is like a father, gentle and safe. He will put you on top of his shoulders to give you a bird's eye view of all of creation. God is like three dancers, graceful and precise. They move to the same music in very different ways, showcasing all of God's elegance and rhythm in your life. God is like a rainbow, vivid and full of color, a dazzling reminder of promise and hope for all people after a storm. And God is like a best friend, faithful and true, closer to you than even your brothers or sisters. And because we know what God is like, we know that God is kind. God is forgiving. God is slow to get angry. God is quick to be glad. God is happy when you tell the truth and sad when things are unfair. She is your protector. He is trustworthy. They are friends when you feel alone. God hopes. God perseveres. What is God like? That's a very big question. One that people from places all around the world, throughout all time, have answered in many different ways. Keep searching. Keep wondering. Keep learning about God. But whenever you aren't sure what God is like, think about what makes you feel safe, what makes you feel brave, and what makes you feel loved. That's what God is like. Thanks, Sarah. Let's pause for a few moments now to breathe and to pray. Gracious God, we are thankful that you are present. We are thankful that in the midst of electronic chaos, in the midst of unexpected changes, in the midst of unexpected catastrophes, in the midst of things not going the way we expect, you are present. We thank you for these words of reminder of who you are and what you are like. From dear Rachel. 
And we thank you for these words from Scripture that we're about to hear. May your spirit be present and speak to us through all of them. And may the words of my mouth, the thoughts and dreams and meditations of our hearts be a delight to you. For God, you are our delight. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Our two readings are from the Hebrew Scriptures today. The first from the book of Exodus chapter 19 and the second verses from the 103rd Psalm. Let's listen together to God's Word. Three months to the day after their departure from Egypt, the Israelites came to the desert of Sinai. They had traveled from Rephidim into the desert of Sinai and camped there in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God and Yahweh called out from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob, what you are to tell the Israelites. You saw for yourselves what I did to Egypt, how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. If you now listen to my voice and keep my covenant, then out of all people, you will be my cherished ones. Truly, the whole earth is my own, but you will be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words you are to say to the Israelites. Moses descended from the mountain, summoning the elders of the people. He laid down for them the things Yahweh had said to him. The people answered with one voice, What Yahweh has said, we will do. When Moses went up to God to deliver the response of the people, Yahweh said to Moses, I will come to you in a dense cloud, so that when the people hear me speaking with you, they will always have faith in you. Then Moses reported the people's response. And from the psalmist, Bless Yahweh, O my soul, all that is within me, bless God's holy name. Bless Yahweh, O my soul, and remember all God's kindnesses. The one who forgives all your sins is the one who heals all your diseases. The one who ransoms your life from the pit is the one who crowns you with love and tenderness. The one who fills your ears with prosperity also gives you an eagle's youthful energy. How you love justice, Yahweh. You are always on the side of the oppressed. You revealed your intentions to Moses, your deeds to Israel. You are tender and compassionate, Yahweh, slow to anger and loving. Your indignation doesn't endure forever. Your anger lasts only for a short time. You never treat us as our sins deserve. You don't repay us in kind for the injustices we do. For as high as heaven is above the earth, so great is the love for those who revere you. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far you remove our sins from us. As tenderly as parents treat their children, that's how tenderly you treat your worshipers, Yahweh. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. So for the Labor Day holiday this past week, my family and I did something that we haven't done for a while. We hopped on the Max train and we took it to the Oregon Zoo. And we had a chance that afternoon to walk around and be astonished by the amazing array of beautiful creatures in a glorious creation. We eventually got to the eagle habitat and almost immediately, we saw one and then two eagles, bald eagles, perched up atop of tree stumps. And then I walked around the side to see the picture from a different angle, and I noticed a third eagle who was not up on a treetop, but was walking on the ground. And as I got a closer look, I could see that she was attempting to unfurl her beautiful wide wings. And I saw the left wing appear, but not the right. And I got an even closer look and I saw that the right wing was mostly a stump. 
There was still some movement, but clearly it was wounded. It was lost. And the eagle seemed a bit lost as well as she was clawing her way along the ground, trying to find some way to get to higher ground. She did eventually imagine to lift herself up onto a step that was only two or three feet above the ground. And I just took some time and looked at her. And I saw an image appearing not only in my eyes and in my mind, but in my heart. And it wasn't just the image of a sad and wounded majestic bird. It was an image of our nation and our times that we're living in. The bald eagle is the symbol of our nation, and yet here is a symbol of a nation that's commemorating a deeply wounding experience from 20 years ago. A nation that's now more wounded than it was then. A nation that has been wounded not only by pandemic, but also by our responses to that wounding event over the past 20 years. Responses that have reflected more often than not less virtue and more violence, less character and more chaos, less forbearance and more intolerance, less integrity and more insanity, less faith and more fear. All of this has contributed to this increasing sense of polarization and demonization of others that we seem to be experiencing in so many levels of our lives today. And it's left us where we find ourselves, a wounded eagle with seemingly only one functioning wing, clawing its way along the surface of this bedraggled earth without much capability to be and do what it is created to be and do, to spread those wings and soar, to soar high above the earth in majesty and beauty, strength and solidarity to provide protection and provision, nurture and guidance for others. And I'm reminded of a lyric from one of my favorite songs from one of my favorite groups, Wilka. One wing will never ever fly, dear. Neither yours nor mine. I fear we can only wave goodbye. Kind of descriptive of much of what we're experiencing in our lives, is it not? as a local community here in Portland, as a faith community here at Moreland. We're part of that national and international community that is wounded and weary, grieving seemingly continual losses, perceiving increasing separateness, dividedness, so many different levels. It's like we're a one-winged eagle trying to find its way through these times into a place of deeper and broader wholeness and togetherness. A community that's needing space to rest and to breathe, to return to its center, to its source of love and life, to be reminded that the presence and nature of that source can be found through familiar images that can bring us comfort. But images that also invite us to experience what's familiar through senses that have now been sifted through challenges. Senses that have been shifted to perceive life in new and different ways as life keeps moving forward in new and different ways. And so the first image of God, of love, of the divine presence that we have here in the story that Sarah just shared 
and in our scripture is of God being like an eagle. But it's not a perfect image. None of these images are intended to be perfect. An eagle is a wild animal. They at times allow their young to quarrel with each other, and even in extreme cases to devour each other. Eagles hunt for prey often that is larger than themselves, and at times they can be ruthless in their focus and ruthless in their ferocity when they're challenged. But eagles also nurture their young with ferocity. Eagles have sharp enough vision to identify both potential threats and possibilities much quicker than most any other animal. And in the imagery from our scriptures today, eagles show their care and provision and encouragement by spreading those large wings, not only to provide shade and shelter and protection, but also to help their young ones learn to be and do what they're created to be and do. You see, part of the process for a fledgling eagle to learn to fly is by their parent prompting them and even prodding them and even occasionally nudging them out of the nest to attempt to fly. And they initially do what's expected they fall. They flap their small wings in a seemingly futile attempt to build the velocity to be able to lift themselves aloft. But as the young one is flimsily falling, the parent eagle spreads those wide, wide and wondrous wings and swoops down beneath the fledgling eagle to catch her as she's falling on her back and to raise her back up into the sky to try again, and again, and again, until eventually the young one is finding her wings and beginning to soar herself. I'd say that's a pretty apt metaphor, possibly even helpful for us in these times as life circumstances have pushed us time and time again out of our spaces of familiarity and comfort. Those spaces of safety and security, we often feel like we're falling uncontrollably into a disoriented unknown, plummeting towards our potentially painful end. Until seemingly out of nowhere, we find one who is now here with us, catching us as we fall into our despair, providing a softer landing than we were anticipating, and then lifting us up again, and again, and again, until our sense of balance and confidence is restored, and we are actually being and doing what we are created for, often without even realizing it, we're not just surviving, we're soaring. Well, I wonder, will that wounded eagle at the zoo ever grow back her mostly missing right wing? I don't know, I'm not a zoologist. It depends on whether that wing was clipped or pinioned. If the wing was pinioned, it was essentially amputated. And so most likely, it will not grow back. But if that wing was clipped, then most likely it will. Both experiences of pinioning and clipping are painful. There's no getting around that. But with a wing clipping, parts of the wing are trimmed back, and the feathers then need time to molt and slowly grow back in. 
And I can understand with all of the losses that we have experienced and are experiencing, we may feel like one of our wings has been pinioned, amputated, lost. And there goes our ability to fly. But I wonder, even amidst all of the pain and suffering and grief that we are living with, if we are actually in a space where one of our wings hasn't been pinioned but clipped. And it, and we, need time to return to our nest and rest. To rest in that nurturing and loving. That gathering in of embrace from our loving life giver. To recenter in that core of our being. To be able to reflect upon all that we have in here. Like we as a nation did yesterday. And to allow those emerging feathers the space and the grace to do what they do naturally. So that the clipped wing can heal. It's been frightening and exhausting for us to live in what feels like almost a continual state of free fall. In fact, I'd like to nominate a theme song for our experience of pandemic, Free Falling by Tom Petty. How often is life feeling like that right now? And it is exasperating and exhausting. And then when you add on top of that, the prospect of life circumstances nudging us out of our nests and back into the air, if you're like me, you're wondering, oh God, not again. Where does that leave us? Well, believe it or not, it leaves us in a space of good news. Because the good news is we don't have to get ahead of ourselves. All we need to do right now is return to our mess and rest and recover and reflect and allow that image of God as that great eagle, that great lover and nurturer and protector and uplifter to comfort us and encourage us. To allow that experience of nurturing and renewal and healing to happen. And also to remember that when life inevitably does nudge us back out of that nest and into the skies, that magnificent bird with those beautiful broad wings will swoop down beneath us to catch us and to carry us and to lift us up again and again and again to help us, to support us as we live and move through our process of, to quote Mr. Petty once again, learning to fly. Learning to fly again. That presence of our beloved eagle lifting us up and supporting us until we are ready to leap out in faith and to soar back into those skies as ourselves. Amen. As we respond to God's word for us today, I'd like to do that 
in these moments with a few moments of silence. As we ponder that image and that presence of God being like a great evil, as we consider all that we have lived through and all that we're experiencing now, all of the great needs in our families, in our community, in our world. And to just take a few moments in silence and to lift all of that up to God in prayer. So let's join together in prayer. Gracious God, in the midst of these harrowing days, we thank you for your hallowing presence. In the midst of our weariness, we are thankful for the reminder that as we actively, intentionally, mindfully, prayerfully wait, We will find our strength restored and renewed. We thank you for the ways that you lift us up on eagle's wings so that we can walk and not faint. We can run and not be weary. We can fly. For all of those needing that comforting, encouraging support. We think especially today of the family of dear Jim Strong, the gift that he has been and is to our family of faith and to our broader community. And we lift up dear Kathy and their children and families and pray that they might sense and experience your protective, sheltering, nurturing, and comforting means of love and support surrounding them and enfolding them. For all who continue to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, who are experiencing loss of loved ones, who are experiencing losses in other levels of life, our neighbors who are housing insecure, those who have lost their employment, those who are needing medical care and attention, those who are needing a hand up, those who are in need of food and clothing, those who are in need of nurture and presence and friendship. As you spread your wings of love and presence and healing, God, may you empower us to do the same with our wings. Wounded though they may be, And 
In your precious and powerful love. And in your name we pray. Amen. A reminder of a couple of things that are happening today and in the days ahead in our life together. Immediately following this worship service, I guess it's supposed to be happening now. It'll happen when it happens. Immediately following this worship service, we'll be having a congregational meeting where we will hear a report from our nominating committee and have a chance to receive and elect uh, new people from among our community to serve as elders and deacons. So all of you who are members who are here, we invite you to stay for an additional few minutes for that meeting. And if we are streaming, are we streaming? We are streaming. Hi, streaming folks. It's been chaos here this morning, and thank you for sticking with us. We invite you to join on Zoom following the worship service for our congregational meeting. Another exciting thing that's happening today is that we have the opportunity to go into our neighborhood and to distribute bags to be filled with food for our neighborhood food drive for Mainstream Portland. If you are able to help in that endeavor, um, there are people who will be heading out uh, immediately following the congregational meeting with those bags that are in the narthex. And Sarah Gibson is heading up that effort and others on the Mission of Peacemaking team as well. We invite you to join with us, take a little time and reach out to our neighbors. That food will be returned next Sunday, one week from today. So all of you who have been gathering food and extending that to your neighborhoods, feel free to bring that food here next Sunday, anytime between 9.30 a.m. and 11.30 a.m. Later today at 1 p.m., back here in the sanctuary, we'll be having a memorial celebration for Kay Siler. We invite you to come back for that at 1. Youth group is happening tonight at 6 p.m. As always, they'll be meeting in the parking lot, and they will also be distributing bags um, to some of those streets in the neighborhood who don't get reached this morning. The Wednesday a.m. Uh, scripture study and conversation group happens on Zoom. All ages and stages, all genders welcome. Wednesday at 8 on Zoom. And then finally, there is a special opportunity coming this Saturday, a book conversation with our own Marshall Welch, who has just released his latest novel, Backup. That'll be happening Saturday evening, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. over at Selwood Park in an area, a grass area right by the public swimming pool there. Um, you're invited to bring a lawn or camp chair, your copy of the book, book is available on Amazon, and a mask since the group will be socially distancing outside. There will be a special giveaway of a bottle of wine to one lucky attender. So uh, come on out and join the fellowship and the fun on Saturday night. Also wanted to let you know that next Sunday, my family and I will not be with you. We have had an unexpected death in our extended family down in Southern California, and so we will be heading down next weekend for that memorial celebration. The rest of the staff team will be here with you to lead in worship and join in worship with you. And I'll be back with you on the 26th. Friends, through all of the chaos and all of the unexpected challenges, you have remained faithful. And there's no way we could say thank you enough for all of the ways that you give of yourself, your time, your talents, your resources, as a way for us to give thanks to the giver of all good gifts. Now let's present our gifts and tithes and offerings. <laughs>
Friends, as we give thanks to God for all of God's amazing gifts in our lives, let's do that through saying together the prayer that Jesus taught his first followers to pray, the Lord's Prayer. Our hymn of sending is, Arise, Your Light Has Come. <laughs> 